Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very exciting episode of Chip Talks. So today we are very privileged to have Adria Berry with us. Adria is the director of the Oklahoma Medical Marijuana Authority. So Adria is a regulator, is the regulator in Oklahoma. So we're very excited to have you with us today, Adria. And thank you for joining the show. Sure. Hi, Chip. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. All right. We've got a lot to talk about. Uh, we we know each other relatively well, so uh, we do have some you know personal relationships. So this should go kind of smooth and interesting and comfortable. I hope. But first of all, I kind of want to just get your impressions of you know a, a lot of people around the country think that Oklahoma is out of control. You know, and I hear this all the time. I wrote the legislation. So people, bleh, you know, get on me about how horrible the law I wrote. They likely also get on you about how out of control Oklahoma is. Let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about how out of control Oklahoma was and what you've done to kind of get things under control and what Oklahoma's like now. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Chip. And it's a big question. And yes, you've seen it all from day one. So you, um, I, we're part of 788 and the creation of this new industry. Over the years after 788, you know, uh, I think some people from across the, the nation and the world even paid attention to Oklahoma and, and kind of started coming to Oklahoma and taking up some of our rural uh, land to, to do these large grow facilities. And as we've learned since then, some of those were done fraudulently. And so by the time I came into this role in 2021, the conversations were about how do we rein this back in so that it is just focused on actual medical marijuana, so the industry and the patients? So that's a that's a tall order. Uh, that means at that time it was around twelve thousand or so licensees, commercial licensees, when I came in. And so taking a look at it from from big picture, saying, okay, how do we make sure every single one of these licensees is doing this for the right reasons and making sure they're growing, processing, testing, and selling products that are safe for consumption, safe for patient use. And so we just had to start there with that really big question. And everything we've done since then in the last couple of years has been towards reaching that goal of ensuring at the end of the day that what patients purchase at dispensaries they know is a safe product. All of that to say, we have been able to go out and identify people that are either criminal actors or people who maybe just don't want to be in a regulated industry. So those are very different paths, right? That we get, we hear a lot of talk about criminal organizations coming into Oklahoma, and that certainly is a big issue. But we also have this other path of people that maybe they they just don't want to be regulated. And so they're just not interested in following regulations. That's the side where we most actively work, where we go out and we do an inspection and we come in and we see things are not in order. So things are not traceable or we can't identify which batch something came from, a product came from that we're looking at. Those are issues that truly do affect the end result, which is the patient, the product. So the reason we implement regulation is to make sure we can follow that product and make sure we know that it is being grown safely and tested properly, processed safely, uh, so that the patients at the end of the day have a safe product. So we deal a lot with people who maybe just don't understand or don't, there are lots of layers, maybe don't understand regulation or just didn't realize there were so many rules or just don't want regulation. There's a lot of different layers. The criminal organizations are generally handled by Bureau of Narcotics, the Attorney General's Office, local law enforcement. We get involved just purely on that regulatory side. We kind of work together with law enforcement to build the like the whole picture of what's going on at, at our licensed locations. That was a lot. I know at once. So if I didn't clear, clarify anything, please let me know. Okay. No, that was really good. And it, you know, the, because of the way that, you know, the law was written here in Oklahoma, but you know, we had free market and, and, and the way that the regulations were written right off really uh, kind of, and it, and it wasn't the activists, it was really more the department of health that kind of wrote the, the regulations right off. But it, they really opened the door for everyone. And and we, Oklahoma and everybody, didn't do a good job of guarding the gate. Like, for instance, you know, you could get a marijuana license with no inspection. And it was the only license that health would let, you know, without. And that wasn't you. You know, that was previous administration. But that allowed this giant hole in our it just allowed us to be wide open as a state and and can you talk a little bit about you know that and and kind of the china stuff that happened and we had a bad attorney and you know we got a real black eye i think around the country for that 
Yeah, we did. There are multiple layers because there is the the talk about us being wild and, and in a bad way. And then there's the talk of us trying out this free market experiment that people are really interested in. There's two sides, you know, and but all of it. That's why I don't think we can talk about Oklahoma or the industry as just one thing, because it's just not. It's really a mix of all of these things. It's a mix of business people who saw an opportunity to invest in a new industry. Maybe they'd never even smoked weed before, but they thought, oh, this looks like a great opportunity. We have them. We have legacy operators who've been doing this way before it was legal. We have people who are really passionate about the plant and just want to grow the most beautiful, perfect plants. So we can't talk about it, you know, in a vacuum. And I know you know that, but that's what I've learned the most in this role. And so when I, when you talk about the gap and the, the gate that was left open, yes, we had, we know now that there was at least one attorney, or at least actually, I guess it was two law firms that were putting Oklahoma citizens' names on licenses, kind of paying them off to put their name on licenses for out of state or even out of country businesses who wanted to come to Oklahoma. That brought in just all kinds of people. It brought in people who couldn't make it in Colorado or California. Maybe things were getting too expensive out there, so they migrated over to Oklahoma, but it also brought in the criminal element. And that's exactly what you're, we hear about a lot right now in the news, especially with, you know, some of the crime that has happened there. It's getting a lot of attention, but it's not, it's, it's just not the only issue. There are so many, that's the thing. It's, there are so many layers to how do we, the bottom of how we truly fix this and, and have a, a truly well-regulated industry. Do you, do you have a, an odd feel for you? Because it literally, cannabis is like the Wild West. So it's, there was, you know, there's no trade organizations. There's no infrastructure. There's, you know, regulation has to be done kind of, oh, we'll learn it as we go. And it's tough, right? It's tough. Do you have a, and I'm sure you, you have some kind of priority list, you know, that you guys work off of, but I'm sure enforcement has to be kind of, just given the state of Oklahoma, enforcement has to be kind of way up there. But it, do you have kind of a pick list of priorities that you guys are working through? Yeah, absolutely. So when I first came in in 2021, you're right. Enforcement was top of the list because it was the biggest priority for the legislature, for the governor, for the attorney general. I mean, it was the, the top priority. So I knew my marching orders were to actually build a team that could do enforcement. And so that was priority one. But from where, from for my job as the the executive director of this agency, it's the true. My job was to build out that plan and then get the right people in the seats that mm -hmm. I could trust to implement the vision that I had for it. And so that obviously took a little bit of time, but we've built some really fantastic teams that have become experts in our rules and regulations, so they can go out and go to a facility and see immediately if that facility is in compliance or not and understand some of the tricks to the trade of where people might be trying to hide stuff or pull the wool over our eyes. So that takes practice. You got to just get out there and see it and learn it. So we built the teams, but it wasn't just enforcement. That's obviously a very high priority. The, the science team, we call it the science team, but the science team uh, works with the medical community. They're the ones who um, oversee the lab the licensed labs in Oklahoma, and they're the ones who worked with our uh, original contract reference lab, QA lab that we had and, and are working to build our own standalone QA lab right now. That's another high priority because we can't, we can't focus so much on the industry that we forget the whole purpose is to consumer make sure patients safety. can have yeah. have the medication they need. Yeah, and consumer safety, you know, most people don't realize this, but it, you know, your number one, I'm sure your number one task from the governor. And in Oklahoma, by the way, just real quick, Adria, Director Barry, or Executive Director Barry is a cabinet level position, you know, reports to the governor. Public safety is obviously, you know, kind of the number one thing, but always in cannabis, it's gonna, you know, enforcement's gonna kind of drop right down there because it's federally illegal. Right. Right. You guys have done a great job, I think, and, and really could stand this up nationally as a good example of the, let's say, the journey that we've been on with a reference lab. And it, it, as you know, you and I know, but people listening might not know it. Labs are the labs are the control point in cannabis regulation. So they're the control point really to check on consumer safety and they're the control point to let things advance, let's say products advance, you know, through the ecosystem. But Oklahoma's done some unique things with a reference lab and we went outside and then we brought that back inside. So do you want to talk a little bit about that and the importance of that and for consumer safety? Yeah, I agree that 
we have done things that we are proud of that we can talk with other states about. And I know you and I have spoken about CANRA, the Cannabis Regulators Association. And when we all come together, we talk about these things. And our most recent meeting, which was just for the member states, our chief science officer, Lee Rhodes, actually was on a panel discussing reference labs, talking to other states about what we tried. And we got to talk to or hear from them about what they've tried. So what we've learned is that public-private partnership is a big, it is a priority, especially under a Republican administration. That's just a, that's a reality. Mm -hmm. And so that we attempted that first. It was before I came to OMA, but there was a private or there was a contract with a private lab to be our quality assurance lab. Um, And it was a a pretty pricey contract for them to do some of the testing. And so when I came in, uh, we started our science team had been monitoring, but my attention was on it because of the price tag. I wanted to make sure we were getting the bang for our buck and really monitoring that. And so as we went along working with them, there became a point at which I just had to make the decision to terminate that contract. And we, at the same time, talked to the legislature about giving us the authority because in statute, we didn't have the authority to make our own lab at that time. So we asked them to give us that authority. They did. And then we immediately started on building our own uh, reference lab, which we are hoping our, our goal is to have it up by this fall. In the interim, though, we are working with our licensed labs to test products for us and give us the results. And when we do that, um, what we're doing is asking three different labs to do it so we can have a good sample of products so we can compare and make sure that we're getting quality results. Cause that is, that is the hard part about cannabis testing is that there is no, there's not enough history to set an absolute standard and every state is struggling with this. Yep. And, and, and it's in labs without a reference lab, uh, labs can get away with bad behavior. Um, yes. Yeah. And, and, and so, so I know at one time, and you may not know this specifically, but it, if you don't, that's fine. But I don't mean to put you on the spot. But I know that at one time we had a, I think we allowed a 20% delta on results. And I think Lee, who's over labs, has tightened that up maybe, you know, with the actual agreement with the lab. So that's gotten a lot tighter now. But there's been a lot of those uh, exercises that have happened around that reference lab that I think have been super important to getting control of things here. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're down to 15% Delta, which is still not as tight as we'd like to see it, but I believe it's down to 15%. And for our lab standardization, there was a bill that passed a couple of years ago. Uh, We brought licensed labs together and not every single one. We kind of identified the ones that we've seen quality uh, testing from. We we brought them into a room and worked with them for um, six months straight on writing the rules on lab standardization. So those are in our current proposed permanent rules for anyone that's interested in looking at that. It's a, it was a la- huge labor of love. Yeah, and I, th- I think it's great what you're doing and you know Lee on your staff is doing is reaching out to these labs and working with the labs rather than just you know dictate. So yes. it's, it's way, way better and much more of a cooperative search situation. The lab situation in Oklahoma has been you know insane. So it's, we had a, I think we still have have a lab owner under FBI investigation. And I know I literally just had a meeting Friday with a money guy who was invested in a lab in Oklahoma, who told me how he got out of the lab market in Oklahoma because of the absolute you know, need for corruption on at every turn. Congratulations on getting that under control. That's been a big deal. So as you look at, let's say, schedule three and potentially what change that might bring about, d- does that lab become more important in your mind, I guess? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Well, schedule three to me, I know there are pros and cons and the industry is you hear both sides, right? We, You and I kind of probably both hear all sides all the time. And that's, that's the norm. But my first thought when I read the reports on schedule three were that this is good news. This will be treated like a true medicine. And that's, that's how I see it. It'll be treated like a medicine. So yeah, the lab will be a very important piece in that. Yeah. And I think schedule three changes the world. It, the, I don't really, I don't know how it's going to change, you know, your job day to day. It, I think your job stays the same. I mean, I think the Oakland, you know, you can't federally come in and change a state's program that would wreck the constitution. And, you know, nobody's going to do that. And the DEA is not going to come in and pull everything back. That's just not, not going to happen again. You'd have that wrecks the constitution. So schedule three will likely be some kind of federal state interface, you know, with your department or with your regulatory, but also with, you know, somebody like the FDA. 
but it'll be over, you know, that exercise, not over, let's say, you know, my grow that I have here or whatever. So I, I, I'm hopeful because all of us in the, the States, we built these patchworks. We now communicate better than I think we ever have since Canada became a thing in 2020. Everyone had was on their own. I mean, every single state was building their own very different program. So just to have some sort of standards, like if us going through this exercise of, of creating lab standards, it's great. I love that we have lab standards, but imagine if that had been done on a more nationwide level and we all had labs testing the exact same way. That's the part that I think will be really positive, but I'm, I'm just looking forward to seeing what happens. It's yeah. on everyone's yeah. mind. <laughs> You know, and, and I think that is coming. In fact, I, um, I've got an interview with, that I did with Roger Stone where we talk a little bit about that and uh, the potential for that coming under a Trump administration. And he's, you know, pretty positive that that will happen under a Trump administration. You know, I don't know under a Democrat or Biden administration whether that'll happen or not. It hasn't yet, so that's not very hopeful. But anyway, I do, I do think that that's, it, it's coming. So I think that that absolutely is coming. That will change, I think. You know, cannabis right now is a little bit still Wild West, a little bit still Yeehaw, and that'll bring more professionalism to it. And we really need that. And, you know, that's just my two cents. But I think it'll be a good thing for the industry. As you look out on kind of I know you and and again, this is something that within our state, at least I try to help with. But it, you have to deal with the legislature. You can make changes to rules within a certain, let's say, you know, gray area. But if you want something to like right now, analytes are a big deal. You want to talk about analytes and trying to get something through the legislature and how that's gone over the last two or three years. <laughs> yes, I would love to just so we can make sure everyone knows how much work's going on in the background. Um, and I know a lot of other states that are working on this as well and other states that have successfully passed legislation to regulate the hemp drive THC products and the analytes and also some states that have completely banned them. In Oklahoma, we've been talking with the legislature on our side from OMA just saying, hey, we're willing to regulate these if this is what you want us to do, because we know these need to be regulated in order to ensure that the products that people are purchasing at gas stations and flea markets are actually tested and safe. If you want to ban them, hey, that's up to you guys too. So we've had those conversations saying, here's here's some options we've seen across the US and telling the legislature we, we need their assistance to clarify what they want to see done in Oklahoma. So as of like right this minute, as we're talking, um, there are still conversations going on and there are so many different mindsets, I would say, at the legislature on what needs to happen that I'm not even sure what it's going to look like this session. You know, it's interesting and I'll, I'll just say this. So our largest, uh, let's say, distributor producer of marijuana in Oklahoma uses an acidic process to flip, you know, CBD distillate to, to, to Delta 9. Um, and right now we don't have any testing you know, in Oklahoma for residual acids, none, zero. So, you know, that's scary. I agree. It's a profit thing, you know, and there's a large, there's a large trade association speaking very loudly for this industry across the U.S. So that's a problem. That's something to consider. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, it, and, and so what uh, she's referring to and, and nicely won't say it is that the hemp industry has a very, very big lobby and a big D.C. lobby. And they're very good at keeping analyte tests out of regula regulation because they don't want them because they want to you know, promote D8 and these, you know, let's say, convenience store, you know, grocery store type uh, CBD products because they're making a lot of money. And especially in Texas, you know, where they're making a whole lot of money. So that's just the reality of it. But it the, you know, trying to get that through our legislature to communicate the importance of that. I know you struggle with, I've struggled with, and they don't get it. And it's really, I think marijuana represents the biggest disconnect between we the people, just us, we the people, and those that we elect to govern us. And they just don't get it. They want to erode, you know, our freedoms and liberties, not you know, kind of help us do what we're trying to do. I, I feel for it. What do you think is a good solution? Like if you had a, per, would it be better for you to have a legislative representative kind of sit with you and understand your world rather than trying to go over there and tell them what you need? Yeah, I think any, yeah, absolutely would be helpful for any legislator to spend some time with us here and see the day-to-day, -day, the ins and outs. But to your point about them not understanding, I. You're absolutely right. But I also think it's 
a symptom of us being a baby industry. We're young. You know, we've got there's I think as time goes on, um, there will be more understanding. And I've even seen it from my side. Some of the legislators that have constituents who went from maybe a traditional agriculture farming um, life to deciding to grow some marijuana. Some of our more rural legislators have taken an interest in understanding what their constituents are going through. And I think as those things happen, you're going to see more interest at the legislature. And also people, you can't really throw a stone without knowing someone who knows someone that uses it and has seen benefits from utilizing cannabis in some form. So, I mean, I think that it just takes a little bit of time. And the unfortunate thing at the Capitol is a lot of times over the past five years uh, since the program was created, the voices have not been the voices that you would necessarily want speaking for you. You know, it's been kind of ad- adversarial and yes. not as professional. And so that really creates a bad uh, stigma at the Capitol uh, around the industry and around patients. And so then there needs to be a little bit more time to combat some of that stigma. Yeah. And it, it's interesting, you know, I, I sued and tied up and, you know, had my meetings up there uh, a couple of days ago and it, you know, it doesn't matter how you go up there. If you're talking about cannabis, you're viewed as an activist, you're viewed as a problem, you're viewed as a, you know, megaphone that I don't really want to hear and just go away. And, you know, we'll tell you kind of what's best for you. And that's a very, very, that's a get me unelected attitude. I'll tell you right now. Yeah. Well, and I'll say if you look at all the industries that get have respect, they have a respectable trade association. So I think that will be huge. Building a trade association that's professional and speaks truly for the industry. That'll be a game changer. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Although you don't necessarily know that you left to Chip Talks. So we had a little bit of a technical difficulty in the middle of our interview with Executive Director Adria Berry of the Oklahoma Medical Marijuana Authority. So we're back for part two. This is the following day. So we're dressed a little bit different than we were yesterday, but we're back and we're ready to pick up the conversation the same way that we were previously. One correction I need to make. So we did state that Executive Director Berry is a cabinet level uh, official in Oklahoma. That's that she does report directly to the governor. So she is a direct report of the governor but she is not a cabinet official directly. Is that pretty much right? That's right, yeah, I'm not a cabinet secretary. I'm just a direct appointee of the governor. Yeah. Okay, and and so it's that's that's a high, high, high level state office, not necessarily, doesn't necessarily get you in the cabinet meetings, right? right. That's right, yes. <laughs> okay. okay, well, let's pick back up. So we were having a great discussion about really Oklahoma and the Oklahoma regulatory. Let's pick it back up with Oklahoma kind of has a unique clause in our law, and, and that's that we allow for interstate commerce. Is Has there been any discussion about that or any look to that at all? Any planning for that or thoughts around that? Yeah, so we've done some research here, Oma, just to understand what we would need to do to open that door. And the, part of that research is looking at other states that have implemented compacts, so interstate compacts for interstate commerce. And so specifically, I think of California, they have really blazed the trail on opening the door to have discussions with their surrounding states on interstate commerce. So what it would take would be a compact with our fellow states. And that is a governor to governor conversation. And so it's either it goes by compact, or we would need maybe legislative clarity to say we, if the legislature came in and said, we want interstate commerce with surrounding states, um, I think they would need to direct how they want to see that done. Because since it has never been done before, and it is still federally illegal, it just adds all those layers. So I think there just needs to be conversations with like, you know, if we, for example, the Texas governor. And so when I've talked to the people in Texas, I don't think they've been really keen on the conversation of opening up interstate compacts. And I don't think Kansas would be either. And so it's just about finding like, wh- is there a state that want would want to even have that conversation with us? Yeah, no, it's interesting. And I, I, I would agree with you. It's going to be a very difficult thing to do while it's still federally illegal until it's descheduled or rescheduled. In your conversations, are you seeing that set up? So those compacts kind of being set up like alcohol, like the way that uh, alcohol is set up now? Would you see that kind of, and again, I, I know we're now rainbows and butterflies and all that, but would you see that flowing into like, let's say we were importing marijuana, would you see that coming into kind of a central warehouse and then our reference lab 
kind of being the validator and the let's say bringer aboard into our seed to sale or you know whatever we're using to track um you know i have not thought as deeply about how the mechanism how it would would be operationalized. I think that those conversations would have to happen about, is that the way to do it? And of course you've thought more about it. So we would want to hear like what, <laughs> what your thoughts are and then see if that's something we can operationalize when the, if this comes uh, down the pike. Yeah, it, it, I, I do. I have thought a lot about this. this is why I've, you know, kind of put interstate commerce in 2015 and, you know, 788, which needs to be revised by the way, we all know that. So it's, and it doesn't look like our, I'm just throwing this in. I'm not, I'm not going to, I won't let you, you know, stab yourself on this stake. But, but uh, you know, it looks like we'll have to do that with initiative petition here in the state, just because our legislature is so clueless on this issue and so clueless on the opportunity, you know, that this presents. And and they really are. It, you know, I, I know uh, you won't comment on that, but I will. Um, and it's very frustrating. You know, I've had conversations with Lieutenant Governor's office about, you know, the opportunities here in Oklahoma. And, and it, you know, you, I can't get any just like nuclear radiation, you know, that you're walking up to the you know, state capitol with. No one really wants to engage with it, which is sad, you know, because it 57% of us wanted this and even more of us want it now. You're a part of CANRA. And I think this is, I think this is a really cool, or I, I, as I've said, and as you know, I was scared of it right off, but I think now it's a, it's turned into a really cool organization. Do you want to talk a little bit about that organization? And I'm, I'm interested in inputs versus outputs. So it's, you know, are you teaching more than you're learning? Are you learning more than you're teaching? Kind of how is that going? How's that interactivity going? Sure. Yeah, I'll kind of paint the picture for you. We have monthly meetings where one designee from each state is on at like a Zoom meeting, basically. And we all come together. We have an agenda where we talk about the organization. We, If there's anything to vote on, we vote on it. But at the end of those meetings, we do kind of a round robin where we all go around and talk about what's happening in our state. And during the legislative season. So during the spring, we all have lots to talk about. So hearing what everyone else is going through is really, really useful. Sometimes it gives us a heads up on what might be coming to Oklahoma legislatively, or even we share industry members with other states. And so we might hear about, let's say, uh, a lab in one state that is um, being shut down. They're going to give us a heads up and say, you know what, I, we know this lab is in a few of your states. So heads up we're shutting them down for these reasons. And so that's been really helpful. As far as the teaching and the learning, when we have our annual stakeholder meeting, which is coming up in June in Minneapolis this year, that brings together stakeholders from, uh, I mean, just across the board. So I'll give you just a few examples. We talked a minute ago about uh, the Minority Cannabis Business Association, the NCIA, normal. And we'll have everything from larger trade associations to, to smaller patient focused groups, um, nonprofits. What we don't allow is we don't want it to ever turn in just to like a bunch of lawyers and lobbyists in the room. And so it, we're really careful about kind of curating the list of who we send the invite out to and making sure it's a, a balanced group of, of people with varying opinions. And then we put people with varying opinions on panels to discuss topics. And so uh, my role is usually uh, just to moderate a, a panel. And I don't even know if I'm moderating this year, or if I'm just on a panel about regulation, it ends up being two days of just learning. I mean, just learning what's going on across the U.S., best practices, what's worked, what hasn't worked. With the stakeholder meeting in June, that one is more, you'll hear more opinions of like, for, because every group has their own opinion. When we have our members only meeting in December, that is purely just regulators talking to each other about what they're doing. So maybe if they're changing their rules, here's why they're changing their rules and here's how they're doing it. And I'll give you an example at our most recent meeting in December. It was in December in Las Vegas because our president of Canada at the time was from Nevada. So there was a reason, there was a tie. There was a panel on receiverships. And I was so interested in that because I don't know anything about it, but it's something that we have to know about because it's um, it's an estate planning issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and our licensees, if they own a medical marijuana business in Oklahoma and they have a license, they need to plan for their for this because it involves the judiciary due to it being, you know, that license only belongs to one person. If that person passes away, can be put into receivership by the court. And so I, I learned all about this and, and heard stories of other states 
another panel was on adverse health events and reporting of those those events, hearing from other states on how they receive information from patients, what they do with that information. That So those were the two panels that I, th- I walked away with the most ideas to come home with, saying we need to implement some processes and get some procedures in place for these things at OMA. Okay, the adverse events, wow, that's great. I, I had no idea that it was that detailed. The adverse events just right off the bat, you know, because it's my kind of area of interest is health, but it that is huge. And it, you know, I'm sorry, guys, cannabis is not the answer to every single, you know, problem. And, and you know, it won't make everything magically go away. And that's not how it works. So we have to study it, we have to understand it. But part of that studying is it admitting, I guess, in the, you know, yeehaw cannabis world that, hey, it, it, it can cause harm, you know, in, in some instances. And that's great. That's really good. You know, we've had two uh, really stunning, I would say, medical studies that have come out last couple of months. One of them was a study on the heart and marijuana and THC usage. And, you know, it's to me, it was a little it's easy to kind of pick apart. It was a little dramatic, but there's no question that THC will increase your heart rate. And again, if you're at risk, that's a bad thing. You don't want to increase your heart rate. Right. You know, there's always risk with anything, anything that's safe. There's always risk. with them. So good. That's really cool. Yeah. Did, what, a quick question on that. Did you guys discuss the because I think this is interesting what Missouri did. They kind of got themselves in a bind. You probably know a lot more about this situation, but what they said was anybody, we're not going to allow, let's say cannabis products in the cannabis market that don't, are not grown, don't come from Genesis marijuana in, in, in Missouri. And they had a situation where there was a person doing what we have a big distributor doing here is taking CBD distillate, flipping it to Delta nine THC and selling that in the regulated uh, THC market. They, were shut down because they were buying CBD flour, hemp flour from out of state. That to me, there's so many barbs and snakes and stuff in that. Did you guys talk about that at all? That has come up on some of our meetings and we all are looking into the hemp cannabinoid issue in different ways. And so we all talk about every single state, we all come together to talk about what we're seeing in our state. But that specific issue, I, I, you know, I do remember reading an article about it and hearing a little bit about it, but I'm not, I'm not super well versed on it. Yeah, it, it was, it was interesting because it just, it by Missouri, you know, putting, you know, I don't know if it's a rule or if it was a law, but by their, you know, insertion of that with the, you know, Missouri only, they kind of created a bad situation and they, you know, it hurt a, a pretty big company there in, in Missouri. And I, I, and I don't know. And what I will say from a regulator perspective, there's always two sides to every story. And so, yeah, it would be good to to get um, Amy's side of the story. She's the director out there. So, yeah, yeah I know you asked for me to, to introduce you to. So we can make that happen. And that's actually the very reason I want to kind of talk to her about that. And just there's always, let's say, help, you know, so and it's always good to get different opinions and, you know, talk to different people, get different sides of things. So and it helps it helps me and everything I'm trying to, you know, for whatever reason, I feel like I have to save the world here, you know, with with medical marijuana. And and I, I don't know why God put that on me, but God put that on me. I like to network with people and kind of let them know I'm here to help. And we're all really rowing the boat in the same direction when you get down to it. So what what do you see as your major challenges over the next, let's say, year, two years? You know, so what do you see as the big things for you, for OMMA, for Oklahoma? And then what do you see as the big opportunities that, you, that you're going to implement, let's say? Okay. Some big things coming up on the horizon are what we discussed on the hemp cannabinoid issue, the hemp-based THC products that are, are in the market, uh, looking at the state legislature and the federal government, just the, either one, whichever one can, uh, can give us some solutions, we'd appreciate it. Uh, so that that's coming, hopefully coming soon and over the next year, no guarantees. I, we're not sure what the state legislature will do at this point and definitely waiting on Congress to, to amend the farm bill and who knows when that'll happen. When that happens, you know, if the regulation is placed at OMA, you know, that'll be a, a, a challenge to implement because we will need to make sure that we have the right structures in place to regulate all of these products. Because right now, the reason I say it's a challenge is when I think about uh, where these products are, we don't even know the scope. (laughs) We have no idea of the scope. And so pulling all that in, we'll have to really build out a strong plan to to implement if we are are charged with regulating. There are so many things 
when I think about the next year, I think it's going to, we're going to get to a place where I think things are kind of evening out. And part of that is in the industry, I mean, and in the Oklahoma industry. And part of that is I, I think because we have taken a stance of pretty of strict compliance, you know, we're applying our regulations strictly. And we look at that as kind of a telling the industry what, what we expect from them. And so with a clear with that clear communication of what we expect, I think things will even out, you know, because the past year has been, past year and a half, uh, two years have just been really bumpy and a lot of, a lot of pain points for people in the industry, for, for OMA, a lot of growth on both sides. And so I think if we all get to the place where we understand, like, we're speaking the same language, industry knows what we expect and there are no surprises, that's what I see coming in the next year. Opportunities, absolutely. The reference lab, the QA lab that we've talked about, cannot wait to get that up and, and going and be able to show data from that lab <laughs> to everyone. I just can't, I can't wait. We have some really cool projects going on. This is one of those things that it's just an internal thing at OMA, but we're implementing some automated process, um, robotic process automation, and it has an ROI. I, I don't even, I shouldn't have said that because I don't remember the number, but we're going to save taxpayer adult, like hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxpayer money by implementing this automated process to process some of our applications, the, the lower level, the, the more simple ones that we can train basically a robot to do. So we still will have humans overseeing it, but we are implementing an automated process. So that's really exciting. Yeah, that's really cool. I would think patient applications, that would be a kind of perfect place for patient. Is there any plan to do a a walk up window for a commercial. I mean, where I can go in and talk to somebody and yes, yes. I'm so okay. glad you said that. Cause I forgot about that. We've been, since we moved to the Capitol complex, we're in one of the buildings near the Capitol. It needed to be renovated. It was the old tax commission building. And part of that renovation was creating a space on the first floor that people can come in and meet with someone. And so we're still in the process of building it out and building out the, the structure for opening the doors basically. But here's what we're, we're looking at right now. And I would love your feedback. We are thinking that we will do it by appointment only so that we don't just have a room full of people just waiting. Um, but if we say your appointments at 9 a.m., someone will be here to meet with you in person and talk with you. Do you think that would work? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, th I agree with you. You can't do it at a la carte. It, you'll, you'll get yeah. swamped and it, you'll have times when you're super busy and times when no one's there. So it's, if you do it, you'll be able to, schedule the flow out and, it'll, and you'll be able to schedule your personnel better, yes. you know, to help. Yes. I think that, but I think that's so helpful. It It's nuanced, you know, it's so nuanced and you do, wouldn't think so. It's just, you know, providing paperwork and kind of establishing proof of, of stuff, but it just, because everybody's so wrapped around the axle about doing it right, it, it, it gets so nuanced. And so I think that's really good. And real quick, I want I want to I want to I want to lay some groundwork. I want to kind of quantify your first comment about looking, let's say, a commercial business owner in the eye and saying, "This is what we expect from you," and 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 you know, here's what we're going to kind of do, you know, for you. So here's the level set. Here's the expectations. And in Oklahoma, when we first rolled this out, so we passed the law in 2018. When we passed the law in 28, and again, this wasn't. Executive Director Barry's, you know, she was in a different role at this time, not over any of this. But when it rolled out, it rolled out completely out of control, right? So, so, and and again, you, I can, you know, give you my opinion on why it did that. But you know, where other programs were very restricted, let's say by those that want to control us, you know, our program wasn't. We won the day with We the People, so they couldn't really do that with our program. So they just said, well let it roll. We'll wait till everybody gets pissed. You know, so that's what it kind of looked like to me. But it, we were in a situation when you came into your role, uh, we had never had, I believe, one inspection even when you stepped into your role. And we had 12,000 commercial licenses or so, most of which, you know, weren't active. So for you just to get everybody inspected, has been a tremendous chore. I would guess now, and you know, I've, it, it's pretty common now out in the industry to just, yeah, you know, we've been inspected several times now and, you know, here's kind of, we know we got our pick list and we fixed it all and, you know, kind of here's what we did. So you've done that and, and congratulations on doing that because that was an unbelievable and almost insurmountable task when you 
stepped into that chair. It does. Looking back, it did seem like a large mountain, <laughs> you know, to like, it didn't seem like we'd get to the other side of the mountain. And I'll say we are still tweaking our processes, you know, and we're still training our inspectors. So nothing is fully, you know, there's no check mark saying, okay, done. We're, we're good. We, we've completed this. I would say our, our, inspectors have grown professionally over the past couple of years, grown into their roles. And we're still continuously navigating like when they're out in the field and they see just specific situations, um, we're just learning, we're learning how to navigate those issues. So all that to say, it's still a work in progress, but thank you for the, you know, thank you yeah. for quantifying that. Your people will run into human trafficking situations, right? right. And, and yeah. uh, people who were malnourished situations and all, all kinds of <laughs> all kinds that's the thing i mean it's some of it you just wouldn't even believe well you learn to just like you, you believe anything you know it's like you can't, can't be surprised anymore but i did want to i wasn't sure if you saw we had a linkedin post letting everyone know that our inspectors now wear body cameras that's something we've implemented over the last several months and it's several several layers of it we started the thought i started it with wanting to help them feel more safe knowing that someone can see where they are right now at back at the office and and they can feel more safe but it also helps us provide clarity i mean because licensees can request the body cam footage from their inspections in open records requests and so then everybody's just on the same page about what happened so it's accountability on both sides it's just it's really it's it's worked really well and you and you almost need that because it's so you have, you know, it's so knee jerk. Everything's so knee jerk right now. It's everybody's so tweaky and, and it, you, you almost need, you know, that additional level of evidence. So that's really good. Last question. Okay. So last question, education, D do you see an opportunity for the OMMA to take an educational role? And what I mean by that is, you know, just consu consumer safety, you know, with patients, but also uh, kind of a, a educational role with other government lawmakers in particular, but other government agencies. Do you see any opportunities to do things like that in the future? I do think so. And that's been something that I, I do see something like that coming. I, I've wanted to do more on that front. And it's a, just a matter of prioritizing. You know, what do, what do we have the resources and the time and the bandwidth and the staff to do? But the education piece my goal has been to put on a conference and it would be purely educational. And we just have not gotten there for multiple reasons. It, you know, I had this big dream of having this big conference where we had education for every single, every single type of licensee, but also bringing in yeah other government agencies. And so education on the environmental side, education on um, home grow, even we like, we have this big dream. We're not letting go of that dream, but what we've learned is putting on a conference as a state agency is a little more difficult. We have to go through a lot of different contracting processes that you don't, that aren't always as intuitive <laughs> as they might be out in the non-government world. Um, so that, but also then budgetary constraints when the, the legislature did not give us the full budget request last year, that was one of the things I had to say, okay, we're going to put that up the the conference on pause but besides the conference why are they funding you it you have the money well they I mean, it, changed they changed that last year okay all they right. took all of our funds uh, yeah interesting all right yeah. i didn't i wasn't aware of that that's yes. a big deal mm. yes they what, did. do you know what uh bill number that was right off the top of your head oh i think it was 1018 maybe but i X, X, X. It was a special session bill, I believe, but I might be completely off. I will make sure you get that. They made us an appropriated agency. And so the licensing and tax funds go to general revenue and then they appropriate funds to us. So last year was the first year that they was set that, an appropriated amount for us. Was that done in secret in the dark of night? No. I, how do we miss that one? Okay, well, yeah. sorry about that. That's on us. Uh, that should have never happened. So again, in in seven eighty eight, the money you know should stay with you, and you give it back to the legislature, and you're under your discretion. You know, yeah. I think it's it, the the thing is the legislature appropriates funds to most state agencies. So then when we became a state agency, a standalone, I, I, they looked at it as like this is just part of the process. So I can't like it's a it's, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> let, 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 that's what we do. So yes. activists. So we'll we'll tackle that one. I'll, I'll have a discussion on that one today. So that's interesting. Well, well I really did wonder if you knew about it because I didn't hear hear anything from you last year. So I thought, huh, maybe maybe you didn't know. 
No, I didn't know. Okay. Uh, I would have I would have been yelling at that one. I would have been up at the Capitol on that one. I would have been in the governor's ear on that one because that was done on purpose and that was done for a reason. And you know, now that leverage and control point is gone. So that's that's kind of sad. Okay. Well, anything else you want to kind of say before we before we wrap her up? It's kind of cliche, but I wanna I want to give a shout out to my team at OMA. We have a great team of people who come every single day and choose to keep coming to this job. It's not always easy. Um, and the internal stuff, the external, um, there's pressures, you know, when, when there are people on social media yelling and spreading lots of false rumors about us, it can make those pressures feel more heavy, but our team does an amazing job of showing up every day. So I want to shout out my team if they watch this and that's, you know, we have over 200 people now, about 250, about a hundred of those are in the field almost every day. So we've, We've got a great team. We have a great team of just lots of professionals here. So I just want to give a shout out. Even when, you know, all you all you seem to hear in social media and that kind of thing is the negatives. You know, if we if something's not working really well with our licensing vendor or, you know, our our call center um, maybe didn't answer the call on time or whatever it is, you hear those things. But on a day to day basis, I would say people in at, at Omar are doing exceptional work. And so I want to just shout them out and say that. Chip, I want to thank you for having me on here. Um, it's just so interesting, our paths of meeting um, back in 2018 to now, like you just would have never seen any of this coming, but thanks for having me on the show and thanks for thanks for the conversation. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you You thanked your team. I think you're a great leader. I, I just, I've watched you build that agency and um, I see how that agency responds to your leadership. And I, I just, I hope you stay in that role. I'm, I'm very glad that you're in that role. And I think Oklahoma needs you in that role. So I'm I'm glad we have you. Oh, so, yeah. well, thank you, Chip. That's very <laughs> kind of you. <laughs> well, this has been good. So thank you. And um, we'll, uh, this will be out. So thank everybody for watching and we'll leave it here. And thank you so much, Director Barry, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.